Here's an example from your textbook to illustrate a chiral molecule, bromochlorofluoromethane. And typically we would draw it the way you see on the left, just to indicate what atoms are in the molecule and how they're connected. But we know in real life a carbon with four single bonds is not a flat molecule. It has this tetrahedral shape, which the ball and stick model shows clearly. And that makes all the difference in the world, because when this tetrahedral molecule uh, is compared to its mirror image, which is on the right, we find that it is non-superimposable. It's all the same atoms, but their orientation in space is fundamentally different. And so they call A and B the two mirror image forms of this molecule, and they're taking molecule B, the, the right-hand image here, and if they turn it around 180 degrees, then they can try to see if they can superimpose this molecule on the original structure, A. And that's what the pictures at the bottom do. If you compare those two, you can see that you could blend them together and get the fluorines and the hydrogens to match up, but then the bromine and the chlorine would not superimpose on each other. And if you flipped it around to get the bromine and chlorine to match up, then the hydrogen and fluorine do not. I've created a YouTube video that illustrates this idea with ball and stick models that I can manipulate and show this a little more clearly. It is important that the four attachments to the carbon be different. Here's a case where we've got a molecule with two fluorines. It is difluorochlorodifluoromethane, and it does have a mirror image, but in this case that mirror image is perfectly superimposable. We could slide these two molecules on top of each other and everything would match up. So we would say in this case the molecule is not chiral, and the other term for that is to say it's achiral. So in this chapter, we're going to tend to focus on the things that, that, that do have that chirality. In order to characterize these molecules and be able to compare enantiomers in a useful way, we have to have some experiment that can tell them apart. Typically, enantiomers will have the same melting points, the same boiling points, they would analyze the same way on, in thin layer chromatography and give the same uh, retention factors. But here's one way in which they are different and why we sometimes call these things optical isomers. They, we say that enantiomers are optically active because they have this ability. They rotate the plane of plane polarized light. If you take the kind of material in your sunglasses called a polarizer, turns out that when light goes through that, it, uh, not all the light gets through, only light vibrating in a particular plane, and that's what's being illustrated here. And it turns out that if that light then goes through a sample that has some optically active substance, one particular enantiomer, maybe it's a liquid that uh, is filling this little container, or maybe it's a solid that's dissolved in a solvent like water. Anyway, if it's chiral, it's going to rotate that light to some degree. Sometimes it goes clockwise, sometimes counterclockwise, but always to a particular uh, a number of degrees. It depends on the wavelength of light that's used. It depends on how long this tube is. The more sample the light passes through, the bigger the effect. And it certainly depends on the actual chemical structure of that chiral substance. And under the same conditions, the mirror image isomer would rotate the light in exactly the opposite fashion. If one enantiomer goes 10 degrees clockwise, the other would go 10 degrees counterclockwise. And so it's this other polarizer at the right hand side that allows you to see uh, to what extent that light has been, has been twisted. And that's an interesting characteristic of chiral molecules. They twist plane polarized light. 